to you. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Program Director. To the Chairperson of Council, Advocate Mugai Tobi, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of WSU, Professor Rushila Songa, to the Archbishop Abu Mahuba and family, to our guest speaker, Dr. Kumsle Mlambonyo, to all members of the Institutional Management Committee, all honored guests, staff, and students, good evening. Good On evening. behalf of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sonia, and the university community, it is indeed an honor for me to welcome you all to the Archbishop Tabo Mahoba Development Trust Annual Lecture on Value-Based Leadership on Local Economic Development. Our university is truly honored to have this partnership with the Archbishop Tabo Mahoba Development Trust. We also are greatly honored to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Pumzle Mlambonyunka. We look forward to the lecture. To the Vice Chancellor, this event comes at a time when our country is operating on a crisis mode. Due to COVID-19 pandemic and all other social ills that have invaded our system of governance. And I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. Now, this lecture also creates an opportunity for us to reflect as an institution and as a nation. Just to say this country needs leaders such as this foundation, who will remind us of where we come from before we lose all the moral fiber that we once had. And you'll agree with me that our WSU vision, which is to become an impactful technology-infused African university, and our slogan, which says, in pursuit of excellence, we agree that the, the, the Archbishop Tabo Mahoba Development Trust is indeed geared towards assisting us in achieving our vision and also ensuring that we continue to strive and, and be in pursuit of excellence. Your foundation is indeed confirming our values, the value of Ubuntu, and we also appreciate that. We also regard your foundation as part of the family of WSU, and we appreciate this partnership. And we want to say, when you come across organizations of this nature, who will also remind you of what we need to do as a country and as an institution, we really embrace this partnership and we appreciate the relationship. Once more, I want to say to all of you, all honored guests, a warm welcome to all of you. And we also look forward to the lecture. Program Director, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Davana Maselesele. Thank you, thank you so much for that uh, well, well, warm welcome. And uh, also apologies that I did not initially acknowledge the presence of our guest speaker, Dr. Pumzile Mlambonyuka, which I am humbly apologetic about. We are aware that the Archbishop Tabo Makoba Development Trust has funded Watasisulu, an amount I cannot disclose here, to have this annual lecture. This is the second time we had it last year. We are very, very uh, appreciative of that gesture, and we would like to ask him to come forth and share with us some background information regarding this partnership. Archbishop, please take the floor and mute yourself, and you can also show your face via a video. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Program Director, and um, uh, thank you. And let me also acknowledge uh, the Vice Chancellor, uh, acknowledge the uh, Campus uh, Rector, and um, acknowledge uh, Professor Marcelo Selem, Thank you for that welcome, and also acknowledge uh, our guest speaker today. And on behalf of the trustees of the Archbishop Tava Mahoba Development Trust, uh, who are 
Dr. Louisa Mujela, Dr. Gloria Sirobe, Mrs. Lungelo Makoba, and our staff, uh, Molly Janki. I'm so grateful for our partnership with uh, the Walter Sisuli University, named after that remarkable and selfless leader who taught Walter Sisulu. Uh, thank you uh, indeed for this partnership. Uh, the trust has been in existence for nine years, and we have partnered with uh, uh, six other universities. Uh, uh, for example, University of Limpopo, we look at skills development and rural livelihood. We are in our seventh year of these lectures. At Rose University, we look at values-based uh, leadership, and this is the seventh year at the University of Mpumalanga on ethical and moral leadership. Uh, we are now in our sixth year. At the University of Cape Town, we also look at ethical and moral leadership. At the University of Fort Hare on leadership in local economic uh, development. And of course, uh, in this prestigious university, all of them are prestigious, but um, we are glad to be associated with the Walter C. Sulu University. And this is our second year uh, of partnership. So the trust, in brief, because I'm keen to hear uh, the, the input from the, the guest speaker. Uh, the aim of the trust is uh, to foster partnership with these universities with the hope to promote dialogue in our country, to reflect collectively, and to explore possible solutions to challenges that face our country. And our three pillars are in food security, social justice, and education. And the, these lectures are under education. And with those brief words, uh, once again, Dr. Mlambo Nguka, we are honored that you agreed to address this evening's lecture. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you very much, uh, Archbishop, and thank you for those lovely words and telling us more about uh, the partnership. You may, I think, let me see what I can do here because you're on the screen. All right. I am now going to ask our DVC Academic Affairs and Research, Professor Binza, to do the honor of introducing our guest speaker today who is Dr. Pumzilem Lambonuka, more about her, will be said by our DVC Academic Affairs and Research. Professor Binza, you may unmute and you may show us your video. Thank you very much. Please take the stage. Professor Binza? Prof, please, uh, you are in now on the program. You're supposed to introduce the, the guest speaker. Today's program for the annual lecture All right. Uh, while that lecture seems to be experiencing some technical problems, we will take you back there. It's the Archbishop Tom Mahoba uh, Development Annual Lecture, which will be addressed by former Deputy President Dr. Pumzile Mlambonguka. As you know, she is also the former Under Secretary General at the UN. She was head of UN Women, and she really has been chosen for her contribution in uh, quite a lot of areas of uh, development uh, here locally and abroad. Let's take you back to that lecture. In again, Archbishop. 
to please share more about the trust itself, what it does, the work that it does around communities and the rest, not necessarily around what it does to the, with the six universities. I know that he's probably not prepared for this, but he could keep us busy until Professor Biza comes in. At Bishop, will be able to willing, are you willing to do that for us? Yeah, yes. Um, okay, please, uh, show us a video. Tell us more about the trust, um, especially your role in women development. Uh, how far can our female students uh, benefit from your trust? And what activities have you prepared or would you be willing to prepare for our female uh, young academics or young students that they can benefit from your trust? Uh, thank you so much, Program Director. Um, I, I pray that the uh, Professor Binza will will come sooner because I don't want to uh, to really rattle. I had not prepared for this particular uh, element. I am very much waiting to hear from Dr. Pumzile Mlambonuka. But in short, the the trusts uh, in those three areas in food security. Uh, 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 education and social justice. Uh, we run in partnership with the U University of the North, um, uh, Rural Livelihoods uh, Program, and um, there is uh, a farm in Makhovaslouf where we try to encourage uh, people uh, to learn farming, uh, to uh, to address uh, the issues of unemployment through the agri ag agrarian uh, uh, matters. And uh, we, in the area of education, besides the lectures, we, we, we partner with schools like in Alexander Township, Polosho School. We've removed all the old blackboards and um, put in the new smart boards. In some of the most rural um, uh, schools in Tabine, next to Linyenye, outside Zanini, uh, we have uh, bought uh, desks uh, for uh, a school there. Uh, we, we also work outside uh, South Africa in Lesotho, there's a school. Um, where we have provided uniform for, uh, for, for, for the children. Uh, and then in the area of social justice, uh, maybe let me stay, uh, during the time of COVID, we have managed to support a, a number of uh, small uh, business enterprises. We partner with others that have got more money in order to share uh, with those that uh, uh, do not have. And uh, in, if you Googled Archbishop Tabo Mahova Development Trust, you will see some of the, uh, some of the uh, areas uh, that, uh, that we cover. I don't want to, to be long. And I just want to hand over to uh, uh, to you, uh, possibly uh, Professor Biza is back. All right, ladies and gentlemen, at this juncture, I think we can continue. I'm informed that uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Pumzim Lambonuka, will be leaving very uh, early today because she's got other commitments. So we don't want to keep her waiting. Professor Binza will come in maybe later on and introduce her. But all I can say is she's a woman of repute, very highly educated. She has served in the UN Women. She's been our deputy vice president at one time. She's very much uh, an activist in women affairs and education. And she's somebody that most girls uh, look up to. She's very reachable. You send her an email, she responds. She's unselfish. And at this juncture, I would like to call her to come and deliver her speech. Then the rest will follow later on. Dr. Pumzilem Lamonguka, please prepare yourself and mute. Show us your video, and then you can take over from here. Let's join hands, ladies and gentlemen, 
to welcome our guest speaker today, Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Nuka. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Program Chair. Uh, I would like to greet uh, the Chancellor. Uh, I don't know if she's there, Sula, Sula Susulu. Uh, Bishop, Gash Bishop, uh, good evening. Great uh, advocate, Nguga uh, Toby, uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Nolundi Songa, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Mzigayuse Binza, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dr. Prince Jata, Executive Management, uh, students and uh, staff of Walter Sisulu University. Good evening, and it's a pleasure to see you tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the support that the students have received from Archbishop. Thank you, Archbishop, for this uh, support and for the encouragement that this support gives to students. Uh, and to the students, thank you for the work that you have done, which has made you deserve the, the support that has been given by the bishop. We are in a, a learning institution where you learn to write. Uh, we are in an age and a time where women must not uh, ask uh, to participate, must not just demand to participate but must simply take their space because uh, we are at a critical time and the slow mechanisms that tend to derail women have become just unbearable to, to many of us. Patriarchy doesn't celebrate women uh, who write, who are outstanding speakers, uh, they don't celebrate women who are, patriarchy doesn't celebrate women who are role models. So women have got to own the space whenever they have a possibility uh, to, to do that. Our education is important to all of us. Uh, education in the world is important to men and women and to the younger generation. In 1995, in Beijing, China, where nations gathered and uh, adopted the Beijing Declaration uh, and produced a blueprint on women's uh, equality, at that conference, education was highlighted and in fact, it was the African women who were particularly insistent on the importance of education. They also highlighted the importance of profiling girls, uh, in not just as children, but girl children, because of the specific challenges that girl children faced. Education being one, when at that time, and still in some countries, it is still like that. It is very easy to just take girls out of schools or to stop a girl from proceeding with her education. Young girls are forced to marry because just because they are a girl, they suffer this challenge of forced early marriage. Young girls experience gender-based violence including female genital mutilation. And of course, many of the girls experience non-consensual sex. And many of them we have seen, especially in East and Southern Africa, that uh, they have become uh, victims of uh, uh, the older men, uh, leading to these young girls 
being infected with the uh, HIV and AIDS. And this remains an issue of great concern because we are still the region in the world that has a, a high incident of HIV and, and AIDS. And at the same time, girls who are at school are the ones that are most likely to expect to, to, to uh, uh, escape this uh, horrendous act. So in some way, if you like, you can say that education is actually a, a way to prevent the spread of HIV and, and AIDS. It was interesting that uh, in Beijing in 1995, many governments actually uh, were receptive to the call of women. The countries that had neglected education up to that time worked very hard uh, to bring girls to school, leading to many countries uh, uh, increasing their en enrollment. Uh, South Africa was one of the countries which also did very well and increased the enrollment of girls um, in school. However, we had setbacks in countries that are uh, at war where we saw girls drop out of school, girls still co continuing to be forced to marry, girls uh, were also being uh, trafficked. In countries which have forged ahead with education, we have seen that girls have distinguished themselves very well. In many countries now, there are more girls than boys at university level. However, sadly, uh, girls do not get the jobs that correspond with their levels of education. So that is a challenge that we still um, uh, we still have to face. Um, we also uh, in in Beijing in in, in 1995 uh, highlighted the importance of jobs for young people a challenge that we're facing again in this country and in many other parts of the world, and a challenge that has become much more complicated as a result of the pandemic. Now, there is no gender neutral uh, pandemic and COVID was not an exception. Uh, women uh, do not uh, suffer because of the disease itself, they suffer because of the underlying issues in society that discriminate against them. Uh, they suffer because of the way the disease is managed, which tends to carry on uh, the discriminatory practices that women suffer. And we have seen that also in COVID across uh, uh, the world. Uh, we saw sadly that uh, a, a larger number of men died uh, during the pandemic, from the pandemic, in part because men uh, are less likely to be as vigilant about uh, their health care as women are. Something that we have to be concerned about, we have to, we have to address even after uh, COVID, because it's not whether we will have another pandemic, it is when we will have another pandemic and it should not find us in this same situation. But uh, women uh, suffered the socio-economic challenges that were generated by the uh, pandemic. Two thirds of the jobs that were lost during the pandemic were lost by women, uh, by women jobs in the service industries, in tourism, hospitality, as well as women in the informal sector. And in Africa, the, the informal sector is a big sector. Two thirds of women who work outside their homes work in the informal sector. And these are women who have the hardest time to pick themselves up again. And the fiscal uh, interventions that governments provided to help and support women have tended not to reach women very well. It is something that we have to work for. 
But in any case, governments have no fiscal space now, including our own government. So women are actually in a very, very serious situation. And then girls dropped out of school in large numbers in many countries. Uh, girls were married off uh, during the pandemic. They were trafficked. And that too has caused a lot of hardships. Uh, women also who do not have digital literacy were unable to pack their laptop and go back and continue working at home. Uh, for them, life was at a standstill. And for many, life has not been able to continue again. And that raises the importance of digital literacy in our schools and the role of university and all of us, of universities and all of us in promoting digital literacy um, in, in, in our schools. It is now a, a basic a need. And in fact, a, recently the Pope was discussing digital literacy as a basic right, because if you do not have digital literacy, the future of work is very bleak. I am working in a foundation, my foundation, where we do digital literacy. Luckily, uh, teachers uh, have understood this challenge. I am very encouraged by their enthusiasm and the hard work in the training program. And we are looking forward to their graduation in February uh, uh, next year. Uh, teachers are the ones who will also pass on those skills to children in a structured manner so that children do not just use their gadgets to play, but they use their gadgets uh, to learn. And of course, we also now get inquiries from parents who are saying, what about us? Because many of the parents have also uh, found that finding a job that can sustain you without digital literacy is, um, is, is, is important. Uh, we continue to have to educate also our public representatives. We've just had our local government election where we were exposed to the many challenges of our country. The need for education and training of a elected representative is real. And I'm raising this to you as a university. You have to ask yourself in the Eastern Cape where you are, how can you help these elected representatives to know how to do their job, to acquire the relevant skills uh, required for someone who is entrusted with the governance of our countries. Otherwise, our country is in big, big trouble. We also need to engage with our public representatives on ethical leadership and the responses they have as stewards who are looking after the resources of uh, uh, the nation. It is important to remind public representatives that they're not public bosses. They are public servants and they are elected representatives. And to be an elected public representative is to choose to serve, not to be served, is to sacrifice and not to enrich yourself. All of these are issues that I think uh, we have failed to teach, but also we have allowed unscrupulous people to be dominant in our public space. And that has led to untold suffering to our people. So as I thank uh, the Archbishop for his work and for his support, I would like to urge all of us to work in collaboration with the Archbishop to support his work to support the kind of work he takes on in terms of uh, leadership training so that hopefully we can uh, turn the situation around. We cannot leave this country to our children as it is. 
we also have to fight against gender inequality in all its forms, fight against violence against women in all its forms. We are the first generation that has a possibility to turn a, a, and, and to drive a gender equality in a significant way because we have seen a lot. We know the questions and we know the answers. The questions that are uh, worrying us in gender equality have answers and these answers are within reach. We also are the last generation with the possibility to stop the planet from extinction. Climate change is our issue. We cannot be light hearted about it. We need to understand it and we need to make choices of what we are going to do. And again, I'm hoping that universities can uh, take on climate change much more significantly, just like digital literacy, learning and knowing about uh, climate change is now one of the basic things that every student needs to know about and needs to get, uh, get, get involved. And all of us in the community needs to be there to, to, to support. The last thing that we learned from dinosaur is that it is possible to be extinct and we cannot sleepwalk ourselves to extinction. Yes, South Africa is not the worst offender. We are not the worst emitter, but we are a significant emitter, especially in our continent. So it is important for us to, to do something about, for instance, diversifying how we get our energy so that we have got clean energy in our energy mix, as well as not depending just on one uh, institution. ESCOM cannot be all to us. We need other institutions that can be suppliers of uh, energies. Energy, transportation are some of the biggest challenges when it comes to climate change and a change in the way we use those resources, the way we design technologies is important. It is therefore another reason why we need to keep our kids at school so that they can learn and they can be problem solvers. I wish everybody a good luck and I hope uh, we can all rise up to the occasion at this very difficult time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pumzil and Labonuka, for your touching lecture. We've learned a lot of things from your lecture today, and we're happy to know about the type of work that your foundation is doing, hoping that our young ones will follow through and maybe be members of your foundation very soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We understand that we'll be joining another meeting, so we're not going to spend too much time replying to your speech. I would like to go straight to the announcement of our three winners for the competition that has been going on, uh, on uh, critically discussing the role of value-based leadership in local eco economic development. So, the Archbishop Tabo Makoba Development Trust has put in 10,000 rand for this competition. Initially, it was going to go to only one winner, but as a committee, we sat down and said, no, let's divide it into three. So the first winner walks away with 5,000 rand, the second winner walks away with 3,000, and the third winner walks away with 2,000 rand. We had quite a number of entrants, most of them very high quality. Unfortunately, we only had to choose three. And ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to announce our three winners this year. Uh, two of them, I think, have indicated where they're from. Number three, we are still yet to find out. So our first winner, who received a mark of 95%, with a turn it in report of only 5%, WSU requires 15% is Lilita Lungwengwe. Lilita Lungwengwe, you are walking away with 5,000 rand. Congratulations. Our second winner who received a mark of 88% with a turn it in report of 17%, just two, two marks more 
above the required 15% is Sisipo Komisane. Our third winner is uh, Sisipo Komisane will walk away 3,000 rand. Our third winner is Alunwedo Zikali, who received 72%. Alunwedo Zikali did not submit a turn it in report, so she got zero uh, out of five for that item. I wonder if she has submitted it, maybe her mark could have gone higher. So let me repeat, our first winner, 95%, Lilita Lungwengwe, congratulations. Sisipo Komisane, 88%, winner number two. And Alunredo Zikali, number three, you walk away with 2,000 rand and you got a mark yes, of 72%. Congratulations to all these wow. winners. I will be personally taking them through a one-day workshop on writing skills so that they can improve. We had very many entrants and some of them were very, of very high quality. I was talking to the committee of one who actually received 68% and she was number four. Very good quality. Unfortunately, we can only take the best three winners. At this juncture, I would like to welcome advocate Nkukai uh, Tobi, who is going to give us a vote of thanks. Please prepare yourself and take the floor and mute yourself and you can show the video if you want. Thank you so much for listening to me, announcing those winners. After advocate Mkai Tobi, Dr. Bule Luanguza, please prepare yourself to give a vote of thanks. Um, no, advocate Mkai Tobi is from the convocation, sorry, it's message of, message of support. It's only Dr. Nguza that will give a vote of thanks. Yours is a message of support. Thank you so much, advocate. Thank you very much. Um, as, as long as I have a right to speak, uh, whether it is a vote of thanks or a message of support. Um, could I start off by uh, acknowledging and thanking uh, the Archbishop, Dr. Tabo Makoba, for the choice of Walter Sasulu University as one of the partner universities. I also, of course, wish to thank um, Dr. Pumzi Lamlambunuga um, for one, honoring our invitation, notwithstanding the multiple demands on her time, indeed for preparing to give us a lecture and indeed for delivering the lecture. We do not take your presence at our university lightly. And so we are greatly honored that you have taken the time to be with us tonight. We are, at, we are a university at the cusp of development. We are located among the villages of the former Transkai. We are located among the townships of the former South Africa Islander, among the towns of Queenstown. This location is a product of our history. It is bound together with the ugly past of South Africa. When we see leading figures in society responding positively to our invitation, we are encouraged, not so much for ourselves, we are encouraged because of the example that you give to our students, because of the confidence that you give to the public about the role our university, small as it is and distant as it is from the epicenter of economic development. So I want to speak not only on my own behalf as the president of the convocation and chairperson of council, I want to also speak on behalf of former students of the university who are members of the convocation that I lead. Also on behalf of uh, management, we have a dynamic, might I add, dynamic vice chancellor, Rashila Songa, who continues to inspire the entire leadership of the university to be ambitious, to dream, to achieve, 
to want to achieve. Although our university at the time of its establishment was known as the University of Transkei, a flagship program of the apartheid government, in fact, an extension of the Bantustan regime, although it is a place where apartheid policies of separate development were practiced, although its purpose was to educate a Bantustan elite in order to play a role in the civil service of the Pakistan. In reality, those goals of the Pakistan government and those goals of the apartheid government were thwarted by students and some of the lecturers of the university in the 70s and in the 80s, and of course in the 90s. And so the white government of apartheid could not suppress the idealism of the students at the time. Students wanted to study. They wanted to acquire more information than they were receiving in class. They wanted to expand and transcend their knowledge. Today, the university has these dynamic leaders. I've already spoken about our inspirational vice chancellor. We have also leaders at campus level, uh, Professor Mashud Tabana Maselesel was one of them, is one of them, but spoke earlier today. Dr. Jaka is another. These are highly educated individuals who could be playing important roles elsewhere in the country, but they have decided to dedicate their time to be with us to be exemplary to our students, and indeed to quote unquote, plow back the skills and the talent. We need more of this because a university with our history can always do with leadership. I spoke about the foundations of the university and the goals of the apartheid government at the time it established it. I spoke about how these goals were resisted and in fact overcome by a combination of students and lecturers, whose goals was to create a new society in which there would be no distinction according to race, in which tribalism would be overcome, in which the intention of offering inferior university education would be defeated. The ways in which all of this would be achieved, included self-help, additional classes, assistance to others, going beyond the curriculum. As a result, when South Africa moved to democracy, President Mandela's government drew primarily from the graduates of black universities. These were the epicenters of black university education although they were seen from the outside as Bantustan universities, they themselves did not perceive themselves as Bantustan universities. Instead, in the transition to democracy, they saw themselves as playing a central role in the development, not of the Bantustan, but of the country as a whole. They would expand their influence into the state, into the economy, and indeed into society as a whole. Dr. Mlambo Nguka spoke about the importance of skills. No country can develop without skills. She also spoke about the significance of educating women and girls. This cannot be overemphasized, particularly in an area like the Eastern Cape, where we still draw the primary source of our students in which women still bear the brunt of patriarchy and bear the brunt of underdevelopment. You see this every day when you walk in the villages of the Transkar. Education is education. The quality of it sometimes does not depend on the offering. Often it depends on the individual determination 
the individual effort and the spirit of each individual who receives education. These days, our university incorporates former technicons, border, Transkei Technicon at Butterworth. These are crucial extensions to the old university, which offered traditional university courses because they add a technical dynamic to the offerings of the university. We can continue to make a contribution to society in the same way as in the 80s and in the 90s, there was resistance to Pantosthenism. But we need to transform the way in which education is offered. We need adaptive teaching to respond and take forward the project of democracy. We need to think bigger. And this is the crucial part of the speech made by Dr. Pumzile Mlamunchuk, who did not only refer to South Africa, but indeed referred to global developments. In other words, placing at the heart of global changes, a university like Walter Sassoon. And perhaps the greatest tragedy facing society as a whole, and indeed facing our political class today, is not so much corruption, nor is it incompetence, although the two often receive newspaper headlines. Perhaps if I can go to the essence of Dr. Mlambunuga's speech, perhaps the greatest tragedy facing society is the absence of idealism. It is the indifference to suffering, and so if we are to re-engineer our society, we should start by rekindling the spirit of idealism. What do I mean about this? It is to dream, to dream that things do not have to be the way they are, to believe that change is possible, to believe that we are the people who can bring the change, to trust ourselves, reject the notions of the past where Africans were regarded as lazy, indolent, incompetent. This was the strength of the person after whom the university is named, Walter Sassoon. For 26 years, he was in prison, sometimes alone, sometimes with others, but never with his wife, Mam Albertina, never with his children, never even with his grandchildren. What kept him was the belief the idealism, the belief that things would one day change, but that he could change them. He could change them by being a prisoner, by making a personal sacrifice. It is perhaps that, that belief in idealism that we need to help us navigate the present challenges. This, of course, as Dr. Tabo Mukhoba pointed out, is not possible without values without honesty, without integrity. These are old values. They are nevertheless timeless. The university is the place where the leaders of society are incubated, taught, molded, graduated, and ultimately kept. When we teach our students, we cannot only impart technical skills. We must also teach them soft skills teach them how to care about society, how not to be indifferent to suffering, how to be ambitious for the betterment of society. A week ago, we had a graduation. Many of the students we produced will be unemployed, but this is not a reason to give up on the necessity of university education, but it is to emphasize its significance. To be relevant, we need to change the way we do things. We need to educate leaders that are capable of taking society forward. This is why we are absolutely grateful and honored that today we have two of the most important leaders that have been produced by South Africa in generations that are in the same category as Archbishop Desmond Tutu, in the same category as Mamu Wini Atigizela Mandela, in the same category as Mamu Albertina Sisulu. And so with those words, I want to say on behalf of the convocation, we have not taken your presence for granted. We have instead been enriched as a result of your presence 
and your speech. We wish to strengthen the relationship that we have with your good selves. We want to see how that can make us flourish as a university and indeed what contribution we can make to make your own institutions flourish. The convocation also wishes to congratulate the three students who were one today. It is a crucial competition because it is about writing. And writing is an essential skill of navigating the 21st century economy and the political world, and indeed society as a whole. And raising those competitions is crucial to achieving the essence of what it means to be a university. This year, Professor Songa made a crucial point in her inaugural lecture as a vice chancellor, in which she said that we are no longer a university of the past, nor are we a university in development. We are now a fully fledged university. We've got to take responsibility to move society forward. Doing so means we must take ourselves seriously as the university. A lecture like this is one of the important steps towards taking ourselves as black people, as Africans, seriously. And in those few words, I want again to stress how grateful we have been for your presence, how grateful we have been for the media presence, how grateful we have been indeed for everyone who has been able to log in and attend. Those are the messages I've been told to send on behalf of the former students and graduates of the university that I lead. Thank you, Program Director. And that there is uh, the uh, president of the WSU, Walter Sisul University, convocation, Tembega Ngaito, we advocate Tembega Ngaito, we bring into an end there the Archbishop Tawa Mahoba annual lecture that was addressed by the keynote address there, Pumzile Mlambo Ngaito. We're going to take a quick break. Do stay with us. We've got more news still to come. <laughs>